is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of April 13th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on a national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, some think it's time to talk about the death of the PFD. If so, we address the next chapter, who lost the PFD? Second, we discuss the message sent last week by the combination of the spring revenue forecast followed by Governor Dunleavy's vetoes. And third, the announcement of another new oil fine proves yet again that Alaska has good rocks, but we discuss why that's not enough to ensure a strong future. And now, let's join Michael. we got some big questions to ask. Um, you say maybe it's a little early, Brad, but uh, somebody's eventually going to start asking questions like, um, you know, who took the PFD? I mean, who, who, who that's going to be kind of the question. Who lost the PFD for us? You say it's a little early yet, although I'm, I'm saying it's probably a good time. What, uh, let's start off there with number one. Well, what triggered this, Michael, was a piece by Ed King last week uh, that got a lot of shares and readerships and comments uh, the title of the piece is The Death of the Permanent Fund Dividend. Right. Um, and Ed goes through um, in, in detail why he thinks that is, that is an appropriate title for, uh, for this period of time. I, I, I think it's too early. I, I think that there are still a path uh, to, to maintaining uh, the dividend and, and continuing the dividend. I still think it's, it's too early to declare uh, – uh, what I think is a centerpiece of, of how Alaska operates um, uh, dead. But uh, some, some are, some are, all, are already jumping on that bandwagon and saying that, uh, you know, like Bryce Edgman did a couple of weeks ago in the Facebook post and like Zach Fields did and, and uh, uh, Chuck Kopp did uh, in their uh, ADN editorials uh, uh, the week, a week ago uh, that, that, you know, we've moved on past the PFD, and now we're into now we're into some other uh, environment going forward. That that's disappointing. It's 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 problematic. It's you know that means we've adopted the absolute worst um, uh, approach to raising new revenues uh, in this state. But but that's you know that's 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 been sort of the buildup the last week as people have commented uh, on Ed's piece, and. And I think there's, when we write the book on this, then there's going to be a chapter, uh, just like uh, those of us my age recall during the Cold War, there was, there was this whole period where we went through who lost China, who lost uh, China from, or who lost China to the to the communist Chinese. Uh, I think there's going to be a, a whole chapter on, uh, on or maybe a whole book on uh, on who lost the PFD, um, and and I think it's not only, I think it's not only um, interesting to sort of look back on from a historical perspective, but I think it's useful, frankly, uh, for those who are still engaged in trying to preserve the PFD. I think it's useful to sort of understand um, how we got to this, how we got to this shape. So I sort of charted out in my mind uh, as I was reading Ed's piece, um, or after I finished Ed's piece, about the the sequence and and who really uh, who who really set us up for the loss of the PFD, if that's, if that's where we're going. And I, and I, you know, I hit on four categories or four, four causations. The first is those that built up spending, the, the, our spending structure, our fiscal structure, 
uh, from 2006 to 2014. We were a fairly lean and mean state um, in the late 1990s and the early 2000s right. as we dealt with you know, one of the oil crashes that we've dealt with over Alaska's history. Um, that sort of came to an end in 2006 when oil prices started spiking um, uh, 2007 when, or 2006 when Governor Palin was elected, 2007 when we gen- then changed the uh, the state tax structure, uh, oil tax structure, um, and then as prices spiked between 2006 and 2008, sort of just this monstrous wave of revenues uh, that that came to the state, and and the result, the 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 response to that was to build up state spending. It, it, to some degree, we socked a little bit more in savings. That's when the SBR was the statutory budget reserve was created. Um, that's when the CBR, which had been drained down during the 1990, late 1990s and early 2000s, the CBR was paid back uh, during that period. But there were still revenues left over. And as opposed to uh, socking them away, um, I still recall Bert Stedman, who was around at that point, Sort of saying, oh, we needed to, you know, we needed to restart the Alaska economy. We needed to make up for all of the, the, uh, the, the, the cuts that we had made in the late 1990s and the early 2000s, and and the effect of that was to create a fiscal structure that lives with us to the to to this day. Sort of this this big this this concept of bigger government, certainly bigger than we'd had in the late 1990s and the early 2000s. Right. This big government fix, fiscal structure that we're still dealing with uh, to this day. The second, I think, this, the, so the first is those that build up spending. The second is the failure to restructure that spending once revenue started to, cl- to decline in 2014 and 2019. We brought that big fiscal structure into the early 2010 teens, um, and and once when oil started going back down, as it does, uh, the response was not to uh, uh, restructure what we had what to, to undo what we had restructured in the early uh, in the in the late 2000 zeros. Uh, it was to preserve it and uh, and to and to preserve it by starting to um, uh, tap into those fiscal reserves we built back up. The SBR was drained fairly rapidly. The CBR. We started into the CBR, um, and then in 2016, uh, we started uh, draining the PFD by uh, making uh, PFD cuts. So first was the buildup in spending. The second was the failure to restructure that spending. Um, and many of the people who were involved in building up the spending were still in the legislature and were involved in failing to restructure that spending once, uh, once the revenue started to decline. I think the third, and this is this is where some are going to object, but I think the third is that once it was clear that 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 restructuring uh, the costs, restructuring spending wasn't going to occur, um, I think the third cause was was once that was clear, those that refused to consider more equitable revenue means to to raise to raise the revenues to pay for it um, uh, going forward, and that started around 2016. Once they started. Once we started cutting the PFD, um, the 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 it, it, some focus shifted to well, there are other ways to pay for this. If we're going to continue this spending, there are other ways to pay for it. And in large part, those who um, uh, were responding by saying we need to cut the spending continued down that track, even as the legislature failed to do it. And, and in fact, that track continues today. And really didn't d- didn't want to don't want to, didn't then and don't want to now, recognize that if this spending is going to continue, they're using the PFD for it. The question is, is there a better way, a more equitable way um, uh, to pay for it? And I think the failure to adopt those more equitable ways, uh, frankly, is is another cause of, of the PFD decline. Uh, yes, failing to cut spending, but ramping up spending in the first place is a cause. Failing to cut spending certainly is a cause. But once once you hit the reality, I remember an email I got from an industry lobbyist um, in 2016, I think it was, as I was still and you and I were still talking about we need to cut spending. Right. Uh, The email was we aren't going to cut spending. You've got to face up to that fact. And so I think the third the third cause was the failure to to recognize that that we weren't going to cut spending and and to go down uh, uh, alternative revenues. And then the fourth is is 
this sort of really unholy alliance between the Democrats who claim they, they're looking out for middle and lower income Alaska families uh, and the top 20 percent who don't want to pay for any of this stuff, uh, who, who were part of building up this spending spree, part of preserving the spending spree, but don't want to pay for it themselves. So they've used the PFD to shove it off on middle and lower income Alaska families. The fourth cause of this is, to me, the fourth the, the fourth creation of the death of the PFD, if that's where we're going, is the Democrats who aligned with those top 20 percent and said, yeah, we need to continue government spending. Uh, we can't we can't pass alternative revenues. And so we're just going to agree with you. We, the Democrats, are going to agree with you uh, to continue to take it out of middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts. Well, and I think they, they, they bear as much responsibility as anybody. Well, else. and especially the rural Democrats, where their constituency are much more dependent on the income that the PFD generated. Uh, and the lower income, you know, most a lot of lower income areas are democratically controlled areas for exactly the same reason. I mean, that really that really strikes kind of against what they are supposed to be doing, defending their their population, their constituency. Yeah. And, and we saw that we saw that come up with the Jennifer Johnston deal this last week when Jennifer when Jennifer was 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 <laughs> said whatever she said to Andrew Jensen and and, and caused the uproar. Um, and, and then the rural Democrats come in to defend her. Bryce and others come in to defend her. Um, they 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 they, they uh, um, uh, complain about her words. They they discredit her words. But but they've done the very same thing that she said, which is sort of turn their backs on uh, middle and lower income Alaska families. Not only in the bush, certainly in the bush, but also throughout the rest of Alaska, uh, the rest of Alaska by using the absolute worst mechanism for raising revenues, uh, that that has the largest adverse impact on Alaska families and on the overall Alaska economy, they voted with Jennifer. I mean, they've, right. they've, that, that's been the block that's supported it. So there's, if, if, if we ever do right, you know, if, if Ed's piece is, is, comes to fruition and we do have the death of the PFD, um, I, think there's, I, think, I think we need to analyze how that happened um, and maybe the final step, maybe maybe the step that a lot of people will focus on is the is the Democrats and the and the top twenty percent Republicans aligning to do in middle and lower income Alaska families. But there's a lot more that happened before that. If any of those four things hadn't happened, if we hadn't built up the the financial, uh, the state's uh, 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 fiscal uh, spending uh, structure, if if we hadn't refused to cut it, uh, if we'd gone to alternative revenues. And if the top, if the Democrats, if any of those four things hadn't happened, the PFD would still be around. Right. Um, but well, so I'm hearing a lot of poor, I'm hearing a lot of postmortem on this. Uh, but you're, you're saying you still disagree with uh, Ed's, which, by the way, this is a very deep and thoughtful piece. I really enjoyed reading it because it had a lot of good history on it, it had a lot of good extrapolations of where things were going. But you said the death of the permanent fund is nigh, but not here. Uh, I mean, give me your justification for, uh, you know, for that, you know, for your disagreement with that on that point that we're not quite there yet. Well, I think there's I think there's two things that lie between us and the death. One is um, uh, sort of the realization. I'm an eternal optimist sometimes the the realization that we do need to go to alternative revenues. Um and that there are alternative revenues. There are ways of raising these revenues that have a much lower impact on Alaska families and a much lower impact on the Alaska economy than uh, than than sucking the PFD out. I, I I I think there is the potential for that realization and 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 adopting some one of those um, uh, before we before we come to the crashing end. Um, the second thing is, uh, and this sort of goes hand in hand maybe with the first, is we have the 2020 elections ahead of us. Um, some claim, some assert that that we're going to see this huge groundswell uh, of, of support for representatives who will come in with a much different attitude toward budgets and will uh, and will will take a, a an axe to the budget and and bring spending down. Others claim that that we'll see a much different attitude out of those elected this fall, in terms of using alternative revenues as opposed to the to the PFD. All of that may happen. Uh, any of that may happen, and 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 that would change the dynamic. 
uh, and and save it. And and I, as I say, I'm the eternal optimist. I think there will be support for uh, preserving the PFD. Now, what I'm what I'm less um, uh, optimistic about is is what level the PFDs uh, preserved at. I mean, the top 20 percent have made have made substantial inroads in terms of trying to shove these costs off on middle and lower income Alaska families. And while there may be some pushback to preserve what I guess I would call a token PFD to just sort of keep the concept alive. Right. Um, it, the, the question is, is the level. But there's but there's two things. One, will there come will, will we have a realization that that there are alternative ways that have a much lower impact on Alaska families and the Alaska economy? And the 2020 election. You're you're the optimist. I'm not a pessimist. I'm kind of in the middle. I'm not quite optimistic. I'm not quite pessimistic. Does that make me a realist? I don't know. I don't even know. <laughs> I don't even know at this point. But you know, every time that somebody like Shelley Hughes talks about the cavalry coming up over the hill or the silent majority coming in, I go, boy, that would sure be nice. But I I just don't see it yet. And. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I know a lot of people out there are like, well, we've got to we're going to cut and we're going to change the players and it's going to be it. And I mean, I've been calling for a changing of the players, but I just, you know, I just don't know. I mean, as you, you've pointed out, I think the, the, the thing that I pulled out of everything that you just said, which I think is interesting, is the fact that we have the same group of people there. Uh, that we did in the late 90s, that we had in the early aughts, that we had in the early teens. We've got players in there that have been there for 20 to 30 years doing exactly the same thing. Uh, I mean, how is how is anything ever going to change at that point? Yeah, it's um, – I mean, we, we talk about – we talk about this 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 – unheard majority or the silent majority that's that's gonna that's gonna rise up there definitely is i mean you, you look at the matsu and there's definitely a lot of anger and a lot of pushback and a lot of readiness to 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 take a big you know big axe to the to the state budget a huge amount of that but but the 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 the, the thing you have to keep in mind is we're an entire state right and 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 you don't have that same anger down in southeast uh, there are significant parts of Anchorage where you don't have that same anger. Um, it, it takes an entire state to, to adopt those things. So, yes, I think there is that silent majority, um, and actually it's been a fairly vocal majority throughout um, in the Matsu for those sorts of things and in parts of the Kenai. Uh, but but I'm, not, I'm not sure that uh, that that, that – that that translates into a statewide silent majority uh, and a push uh, for uh, uh, for change. I, I think what I think what we've come to is this: there's not enough. And, and again, Governor Dunleavy tried last year to make the spending cuts uh, necessary to to get down on the road uh, toward uh, toward getting the uh, smaller government and the government we could afford. Uh, with inside traditional revenue uh, uh, levels, I, I think there's, I think there's, a, 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 I think th there isn't enough support to do that. He couldn't, e we couldn't even get 16 to support that level of spending cuts that he that he initially proposed, and 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 so that's that's sort of blocking that that angle. By the same token, there there's not there's not enough support. There has not been enough support for alternative revenues. I mean, some of the same people who say. Spending cuts, spending cuts, spending cuts, nothing but spending cuts, say no alternative revenues, no alternative revenues. And, and Michael, that's contributing as much to the death of the PFD as, as the people who are refusing to make spending cuts. So you've, got, so you've got these two camps, or at least two camps out there, one that say spending cuts are nothing, and, the other that say, that, and, and, and another that says uh, no alternative revenues, sort of the same people, no alternative revenues. And, and, and that... That sort of that sort of block means the only thing that there is to give uh, is the PFD, and 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 that's exactly what's happened. Yeah. So uh, I found it most ironic that some of the, you know you talked about the governor tried to uh, to to get these cuts in, couldn't even find sixteen. I see that Sarah Rasmussen is now. Uh, put up a change petition, change.org petition, to sign the petition to get the spring PFD. Yet at the same time, I think she was one of the ones that was not there in the final stages of supporting the governor's uh, original vetoes, if I recall correctly. Uh, yep. and, and so I, I find it ironic that 
at the time that she's calling for the PFD, she couldn't at least stand by the cuts that the governor was putting on last go around, which would have helped at this point. But, uh, you know, I guess it's the definition of irony. Yeah, it's I mean, we've, we've just got every, every we've got more no's than we've got yeses. We've got we've got and, and that's that's what's really called. We got no's on on people. We can't make enough spending cuts. We've got no's on going to alternative revenues. Um, and those are the really two two options to to preserve the PFD. So if you can't do either one of those, the thing that gives uh, the thing that's in the middle, the grease that, that gets ground out uh is um uh, is pfd cuts and and as i say there may you know at the end of the day there may be some move you know it's alaska tradition all that sort of stuff to preserve some sort of token pfd but it's not it, but it's not it's not going to be uh the pfd uh, structured in the way that's historically been structured or even even pomv uh, 50 50. um and that I, and that's just i mean that's just sad that means that means Alaska has taken the, the this 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 weapon and turned it on ourselves and used the weapon that has the largest adverse impact on Alaska families and the overall Alaska economy. And that's it. That's it right there. I love how Chris says Chris in the chat room says every week it's the same thing with this guy. Have you been listening to this program for five years? Because we talk about similar topics and of the same vein for the last five years. We've been talking about this. And I think we'll continue to talk about it until somebody listens, Brad. I mean, this is, this is, I mean, this is the sign of our time. We've been hammering it, hammering. I mean, I've been hammering these uh, these ideas and these issues, not with the specificity that Brad has brought to it, but I've been talking about this for twenty years on this program. And now, I mean, I feel vindicated because hey, everything that I laid out has kind of come to pass, but. Nobody really seems to, you know, that's why, I mean, I'm, I'm with you. I don't feel like the cavalry is going to come charging over the hill. And, uh, I mean, it, it just, because if they didn't charge over the hill before, if they didn't charge over the hill when Bill Walker first, uh, you know, uh, vetoed the PFD and they didn't get all outraged then, I just don't see them coming together at this point. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong, Brad. Well, no, there's there's big as we as I said, there's big segments of the state that want to make those changes. You look at the Matsu, you look at the Matsu delegation, they want to make those changes. But that's only part of the state. And and the rest of the state, a large part of the rest of the state doesn't want to make those changes. They don't they don't want to reduce government. They're they're they think they found various ways to continue to to pay for government and they're gonna continue to use those, including uh, uh cutting the PFD. Um I, you know, we, we, what you and I have done over the last five years, what you and I have done over the last eight years, maybe even longer than that, is outline ways of avoiding that plane crash. Uh, the plane crash of, of, of cutting the PFD, the plane crash of, of not being able to pay for the government we've built other than, you know, try, taking additional monies out of the private sector. Uh, but, but you know, the, the clouds didn't clear, the, the plane didn't recover, and, and, and you know, we're, we're, we're a little bit away, just a little bit away, away from, the, from the plane crashing. Yeah, I mean, you, you, can, you can do no more than, than outline where, where we're headed, and, and I think that's what we've done. We're on to number two, which has to do with the spring revenue forecast and the governor's lack of vetoes. Uh, Brad, uh, what, what's, uh, g- give us your take on this, your hot take. <laughs> Well, the governor did veto some. He vetoed a little over two hundred million dollars uh, out of the budget as passed by the legislature, um, and and we need to give credit. I mean, since uh, FY nineteen, I did a chart uh, uh, the other day. Since FY nineteen, the last uh, budget done by the Walker administration, uh, spending has come down six percent, and and it's no, it's no small uh, small thing. I mean, the governor has made has made an effort. Legislators, while they didn't back the 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 the, the full uh, the governor's full effort at the beginning of his administration on the on the cuts, the the legislators have nickel and dime themselves and back the governor uh, to some degree on some of the cuts he's made. He's made and he's brought spending down um, by six percent since the since the FY19 budget, and that's and that's an accomplishment. But here's the thing, um, and and we didn't really discuss this last week we didn't really juxtapose i didn't juxtapose the the revenue forecast with the with the spending 
during that same period, since FY19, while the governor and the legislature have brought spending down 6%, revenues, and this is calculating revenues at POMB 5050, it'd be worse if I used the statutory PFD, revenues available to government have fallen by 34%. In this last year alone, revenues fell by, uh, from FY20 to FY21, they've fallen by 12%. That's in one year alone, revenues have fallen that much. If you look at the uh, uh, at the difference between the fall forecast, last year's fall forecast, uh, which is where we thought we were going to be in the fall of 2019, and this year's spring revenue forecast uh, that just came out that presumably is underpinning uh, the governor's budget decisions, revenue between the fall forecast and the spring forecast, uh, revenues fell have fallen by $850 million, roughly a billion dollars. That's 24%. Uh, that's a drop of 24% in the revenues that we thought we were going to have in fall. It, while, while a lot of people focus on on, uh, on on the spending line, what's happened is the bottom's dropped out on us. The, the right. revenue side um, has dropped out on us. When, when this happened in 2014, you remember all of the push – uh, to, to get Walker to, to cut uh, spending back to revenue levels and and you know the great uproar when 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 Walker didn't make uh, didn't make the the legislature and then Walker didn't make the spending cuts necessary to get us back in line uh, with revenues. What you're really hearing crickets <laughs> this time, right? Uh, about the governor's budget and the governor's budget decision not to cut uh, spending back to. Uh, back to revenue levels. And frankly, the drop in revenues that we've experienced, particularly between the fall forecast and the spring forecast, this year the drop in revenues is bigger than the drop in revenues that we were that we were dealing with in 2014. Now ultimately that revenue drop became even bigger still, but but the the single year uh, fall to spring uh, revenue drop is bigger this time uh, than than it was back in 2014. And yet the governor's budget cuts are not immaterial. Uh, I mean, we, we, we're reducing spending from last year to this year by about 4%, but, but they're not anywhere near the level necessary to account for the drop in revenue that we're having. Do you think that part of that uh, reticence to even bring up or to echo some of the sentiment from 2014 is the fact that the governor just got completely burned when he tried it before? Or, you know, what do you think? Yeah, I, I I think that's I think that's a big part of it. I mean, even now, even with these budget, even with these vetoes, he's getting a lot of criticism about oh, he vetoed you know the library and he vetoed um, a real ID uh, funds for the Bush and he vetoed this and he vetoed that. There, there's no appreciation, I don't think, of of the amount of revenue drop uh, that we that we've had. But but Michael, you know, for for those who say. Uh, the spending cuts cavalry is coming over the hill, and we're going to rest- we're going to bring spending down uh, uh, down to, to sustainable levels based on traditional revenues. Two things: one, you would think if that cavalry was out there, they'd be complaining about this. Uh, they're not. I'm not seeing it at least uh, the failure of the governor to to bring spending down uh, in re- in re- re- reflection of this revenue drop. Um, and second, this revenue drop is huge. Even if you thought you think you could you could bring spending down to traditional revenue levels, and that's like a billion dollars in cuts, more than a billion dollars in cuts. Even if you thought you could bring spending down to 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 the levels that we that we the lower levels that we had in the fall forecast, we've just dropped another eight hundred and fifty million dollars from that level in one year. Twenty four twenty four percent of the spending levels that we thought we were going to have last fall. So for those for those who keep saying riding this this horse that says you know spending cuts spending cuts spending cuts that's the way we're going to solve this that's just it, it it's fantasy and it's fantasy not only because we haven't done it not only because not only because the governor um, uh, didn't do it again this year in the face of all of the flack he took uh, for the spending cuts for the vetoes he made last year and for the attempted spending reductions last year but but it's also fantasy because of the revenue drop and, and and the additional revenue drop that, that we're going through right now. And this revenue drop isn't permanent. I mean, we can we, we've talked about that on previous shows. We can talk about it on subsequent shows. But but there's there's no 
there's no cavalry, you know, oil price cavalry coming to, to, to save us on the revenue, revenue <laughs> drop either. Yeah. So, well, you know, we can, we can say spending cuts, by God, you know, we're going to, we're going to hold our breath until we get spending cuts. Well, that's frankly just another cause for the death of the PFD because they're not going to happen. If that's, if that's what you're, if that's what you're, you're, you're putting all your chips on, that's not going to happen. And, and you have to look no further than the reaction to the governor's budget decisions this year in the face of the additional dramatic drop in revenues that we, that we've had. It sure would have been nice to have 14 or $15 billion in the savings account because this short-term drop in revenue, which if you just pointed out is a short-term drop, it'll eventually rebound over the next year or two. Uh, sure would have been nice to have $14 billion in there to offset that. We could have cut it back to traditional revenue amounts and, and coasted for you know 24 months uh, with a little bit of savings cushion to make up for it and then returned to that traditional, that traditional spending level. But unfortunately... A lack of vision uh, in our legislature has led us to this point where they basically spent every penny in sight and you know whatever they could also scrape their hands on out of the PFD and more, and here we sit. Yeah, and I and and let me I don't think I don't think revenues are gonna rebound. I don't I don't think we're looking at a future. If you look at the futures market, certainly I don't think there's a future out there where we even get back to to fifty dollar uh, oil uh, anytime in the next two or three or four years. So I this we we just like in 2014 sort of wrap we need to start getting our head wrapped around this just like 2014 the bottom then the bottom in the revenue picture dropped out dropped down to a certain level but it dropped from where we had been expecting it to be we're going through the same thing right now the same sort of revenue drop that we had in 2014 is happening right now and you're exactly right we've got no cushion we've got no safety net sitting underneath us this time uh, to deal with it so. We got we got no savings. We got no cushion. Uh, uh, we're, we're continuing spending. There isn't the pushback on spending. Revenues have dropped away. What's going to happen? I mean, <laughs> the PFD is going to go first, and then and then there's going to be a, a need for additional revenues on top of that. That's the direction we're going. Yeah. Just reading the chat room here. So all our politicians thought the oil price would stay high or stable. I hate to see it, but the state needs a better source of revenue outside of oil. We've attempted for many years uh, to, you know, create a stable or an alternative revenue stream uh, in this state. We've talked about tourism. We've talked about sales tax. We've talked about a variety of things. But the problem is, is that oil is still the biggest, juiciest market. Now, we did make the change, Brad, um, with the POMV so that we started drawing off of the earnings reserve, which is, again, part of what Hammond envisioned to begin with, 50% for the people, 50% for government. But again, once they saw that opportunity, it was just too big and juicy a target to say, well, you really shouldn't have your 50% because we know better than you how to spend that. Well, it was big and juicy target. And for the top 20%, it was it was like free money. I mean, the top 20% goes, we don't like, we, you know, the PFD is sort of meaningless to us. Um, and so, yeah, we'll give up the PFD and, and, and guess what? We get to keep, ha we get to keep all this big government. We don't have to pay for it. We shove the costs off on middle and lower income Alaska families. It was not only a juicy target in terms of additional dollars. It, it's a free target right. to the top, to the top 20%. And that's, th that's, that's the thing that's so frustrating that, that, that we've, that we're, that we're doing the very thing that has the hardest impact adverse impact on middle and lower income Alaska families. That's that's the most troubling thing to me. Lynn says, I had a really smart politician tell me that there would be no budget cuts until we ran out of money. I was shocked when he first told me, now I get it. Yeah, I think that's probably, they're going to find every bit. And when they run out, then they'll all leave office and then go find something else to do. That, I think, is the bottom line there. Um, all right, well, which leads us here to the last three and a half minutes. We can kick off and start with number three, which is some good news. But how good is the good news? Yep, there was a great article um, uh, this week uh, in in all of the data around a new find um, uh, south of the North Slope, um, uh, in uh, sort of in the foothills of the Brooks Range, by by a group called Pantheon Resources. They had an announcement about a find that they say uh, is roughly equal to ConocoPhillips Alpine Field. That's roughly 100,000 barrels a day at, at peak, um, and it's a it's it's the kind of find it's the kind of news that we've been seeing in terms of what I call rocks in in terms of the geologic 
capability of the North Slope. We saw, you know, we've seen really good news out of Conoco with respect to what they've found uh, in their efforts, uh, exploration efforts, as they've continued to push uh, west uh, on the North Slope. Uh, it's the same sort of, it's a continuation of what we found when uh, Armstrong, uh, uh, oil, uh, and Repsol, and now, and now uh, as a result of its acquisition of Armstrong's interests, oil search, um, uh, have announced the PICA uh, find and the PICA development, and there's been good news about that. There's even been good news in the last few days about, uh, about the drilling results they had uh, on some additional wells they drilled there. And now we've got this additional good news coming out of the coming out of the Brooks the foothills of the Brooks Range, uh, with Pantheon saying that they've had uh, a find, a significant find, uh, along uh, along the slope. The problem is, will we get the investment to do that? And with the oil price drop, uh, I think uh, we're going to have significant concerns about uh, about getting the investment to develop any of those additional uh, right. uh, fi fines. Well, we're having a hard time right now. They're discussing whether or not J.P. Morgan's actually going to finance the acquisition of BP's assets by Hill Corp. And those are pretty, you know, two pretty considered solid companies. And they're like, yeah, we're not even sure right now if we're even going to do this. So, I mean, because of the, you know, because of the oil prices and the, and the demand and the pandemic and everything else, everybody's itchy. So we'll have to see how that plays out. We, we've got a clear path here. Uh, the rocks, Alaska's rocks are turning out to be ever bit as good as, as people hope for. I mean, the developments on the west side, the Conoco's made, the, the Pika prospect, now the Pantheon prospect, we've got good rocks. But but having good rocks, while it's a foundation, is not it does does not bring oil, does not bring that oil out of the ground. That that needs investment. Um, and for various reasons. Uh, we struggle to, to to bring that investment here. Low oil prices, which is the you know the regime we're going to go into here for even lower oil prices, I guess I should say the regime we're going to go into for an extended period. Uh, that's going to make investment even harder. What that's going to do is put a premium on short cycle investment. You know, an investment that you can make today, get oil out of in 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 a very short period of time in a short cycle. Um, and sort of mitigate your risk. You know what you're getting. You know you're, if you put your money in today, you're going to get that money out at, at likely uh, a, 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 an anticipated price uh, in, in a fairly near future. The challenge with Alaska is we're long cycle. We put our money in today, but the oil doesn't come out for several years later, a lot of years later. And the question is whether what price regime that oil is going to come out in uh, once, once the investment finally pays off. And in and, and, and very uncertain oil, in, in very, very uncertain times in terms of oil pricing, long, long cycle investment is at a disadvantage. I mean, because you don't want to put the money in today and find out the, the oil, the price you get for that oil years down the road when it finally comes out is much lower than you anticipated and you had a, had a foolish investment. Much better to make a short cycle investment, even if you're not going to make as much margin as you might make out of a long cycle investment, right. short cycle investments are better because you're more more certain of getting of getting that money out in a short cycle environment. And Alaska is is among the longest cycles uh, investments out there in the world. So, you know, very good news in terms of in terms of you know we have identified a, a way forward in terms of the rocks and the geology and the prospects we have. But but in terms of getting those investment dollars up here. Uh, we're we're going to struggle with that, um, and 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 we may see all of these all of these prospects give us a lot of good news, give us a way forward, give us a path forward, but but without be, being able to deliver on it. All right, well, uh, Brad Keithley, Alaska's for sustainable budgets. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate you coming on board and joining us. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember, you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.